a quick reminder that the uh, homework one will be due tomorrow night, end of day. Um, and the uh, homework two will be released hopefully today. And uh, you have about a month to do the homework. So today we're going to talk about the convolutional uh, networks. Um, just a ref for reference, this, uh, a lot of the content from the slides is, um, is from the previous uh, TA slides. And then I also copy some contents from Andrew N's uh, uh, class. So um, in Monday and Wednesday's lecture, Professor talked about convolutional neural networks as a uh, scanning MLP. And today we're going to talk uh, from another perspective. I'm going um, to cover the math for the um, convolutional neural networks. And I'm going to show you guys how exactly the convolutional neural networks work, um, how we do the back, uh, forward and the backward prop, uh, propagation for the count nets, and then the logic behind them. So what is convolution? Um, mathematically, uh, convolution is a mass operation applied to two uh, functions um, that derives a third function, uh, which uh, expressing how the shape of one is um, modified by the shape of the other. So, um, and it can be applied to any kinds of functions. Um, the, the one that we are interested in is just matrix, conver um, matrix convolution. Um, so if we have, a, um, if we have to com uh, calculate the uh, convolution of matrix A um, convolved by matrix B, we will call that um, just for the terminology, we're going to call the A the input matrix, and B going to be the, the filter or the kernel. Uh, both are fine. And the notation for the convolve operation is this asterisk. Uh, asterisk. And um, the, the whole calculation process is going to be three steps. We, we're going to do an element-wise product, and then we're going to sum them up, and then we're going to slide the filter uh, along the, the input matrix. Uh, we're going to cover this in detail in the next slides. So um, firstly, I'd like to define the convolution of two metrics. So see, this is our, the, the one on top is our input matrix. It's a, a 3 by 5 matrix. And then the, the one below is a filter. It's a 3 by 3 matrix. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to we're gonna put this filter onto this input. Um, for the first portion, the orange portion is, uh, is the one that are currently covered by the filter. And then we're going to do a dot product of this portion uh, with the filter. Uh, a dot product is just an element-wise multiplication, and then you sum them up. So you get the dot product of the two metrics. And the next, uh, which it just uh, following from the previous one, it just uh, get the dot product of those two, give you two here. Uh, so next, we're gonna we're gonna slide the the portion a little bit by just one uh, one dimension here. So you see the orange uh, orange area again shows the area covered by the filter right now on the on the input matrix. So again, we're gonna do this um, dot product here, uh, which gives us three, and then we're just gonna do it one more time um, until the end of the. Uh, of the input matrix. So here I has a animation that actually shows the process. So as you can see that the filter move along the uh, axis of the input matrix and then it reduces the size of the input matrix to a uh, lower dimension uh, convolved future vector. Um, that's the whole idea of uh, convolutional, uh, new, uh, convolutional operation. Uh, on metrics. So next, uh, I'm going to go through a uh, image uh, example. So we know that image is just a matrix uh, with with different uh, channels stacked together. So for example, this one we have a five by five image, and we also have a three by three filters. So the filter is just going to scan everything. You're going to first move along x uh, x axis, and then you're going to move down a little bit from the, to the, like move down along the y axis and that um, continue to do the convolve thing until he, uh, like the filter scan the, the, the whole image. And that gives a reduced size map again. For example, this one, five by five filtered by three by three uh, filter, it's gonna have a three by three output metrics. 
Um, so um, given a, how to com compute a convolution? So given an input, um, we're going to overlay a small window, which we call the filter. Or uh, some people refer to it as the kernel, uh, both are fine. We're going to apply this filter on the, on the input. We're going to find the uh, dot product between the filter and the kernel. And then we're going we're gonna to slide the uh, filter a little bit along the axis. X uh, axis and the Y axis to, count, um, to get the output feature for both the, uh, for both the, uh, for the input uh, matrix. And then we're going to um, continually perform step one and two for all output channels and um, each with a different kernel. I know the, the step three doesn't make sense right now, but we're going to cover uh, in the later slides. So you're gonna, uh, you guys can uh, have a clear idea how this is performed. Any questions by now? No, okay. So um, what we really do is a volume convolution. So um, for example, if we are doing the convolution on a uh, image, we know that like RGB image, we know that RGB image is actually three uh, matrix stacked together. Uh, first channel is uh, red and then green and then blue. They stack together. So um, how are we gonna apply the filter on this? Um, the thing is that we need to stack, we also need to stack the, the filter as well. So for example, for the RGB file, we need three filters um, stacked together as a volume and do the volume, uh, do the volume con convolution on, on the input matrix. And that gonna give us one, uh, yes? Uh, no, um, I would say no, because uh, remember previously we mentioned that different, uh, each with a different kernel there. So it's different filters. Like the parameters there will be, the, will be different. Um, so if you just hold on a minute and uh, I will cover that really soon. So. This, uh, so right now we have a three layers of the image and then three layers of the filter. And then we're gonna count them and then the output, the output shape is gonna just be one time, like one channel uh, image size. And how are we gonna do that? Well, the thing is that we're gonna apply the, the filter, like for each channel in the image, we're gonna apply an independent filter to them. Um, and then we're gonna have the dot product of, of each of them and then we're gonna uh, sum them up so we have a, we have a single uh, output for every for the whole uh, channel, uh, for the whole filter volume. And um, the thing here is that your question is about like whether these filters are the same or not. Um, in this example, they are, they are the same. And then, but you can, you can definitely have different size, uh, different parameters for each kernel. But usually people, like when you are using one volume to scan a image, uh, then it's gonna be the same thing. Does, does that answer your question? Okay. So uh, take a look at this. The, the red channel, the red channel kernel is gonna scan the red channel and then get the numbers. And then the, the yellow and the blue one, uh, the green and the blue one is gonna scan its own channel and then get the dot product and then we sum them up so to get a single integer here, uh, get a single integer here. So three filters, three three by three filters will add them, will add up together, and that gives one dimension, uh, one element in the output matrix. So that's how we reduce the size of the image through convolutional layer. That's also how, why we uh, have three channels in the filter and three channels in the input matrix, but it ends up with just one channel in the output, in the output size. Any questions? Um, so, story so far, um, we have three channels of input and then we convolve it with the three channels of the filter, and then uh, we end up with a four by four uh, matrix with only one channel size. So um, 
how the the dimension changes. Why we like why a six by six channel ends up with a three by three like uh, convolved by a three by three filter ends up with a four by four thing. It's because that it's because that the the like the the number is gonna be reduced by the channel when you like sliding the filter uh, when you sliding the filter along the x and the y axis. It's actually gonna shrink the size, and the channel um, is gonna be uh, the channel is gonna be reduced by the by summing up the values for like we get from each of the filters. Um, and then a good question to ask is that um, does the kernel has a um, completely fit in the uh, inside the input? It doesn't have to be so. For example, if we have a four, uh, five by five Im, uh, image input, we can scan it by a three by three one, um, but it doesn't have to be like exactly the same size. Um, one extreme example will be if we have a if we have a uh, let's say four by four if we have a four by four uh, input matrix. And then we have a three by here. We have a three by three uh, filter. So uh, it will first go this place, and then uh, scan it, get the dot product of this, and then uh, you're gonna you're gonna goes away here, slide among the x, and then go to this place. And then, um, and then if like, um, cause this one has been scanned like by once, and then this one has uh, scanned by twi uh, two times, and then scanned this by two times, and this one gonna uh, scan by one times, by the filter by one time. So uh, if you actually want to scan this two times, you can add paddings here, and then this filter for the next time, the filter just gonna. Uh, move again to this uh, to this portion, so this will be scanned two times. Um, but whether to use a padding or not is totally depends on uh, whether you want to shrink the size of the uh, image or not. And then, like, how much we're we gonna move every time we slide the the filter? Um, that's that's called the stride size. So, uh, for example, the previous examples, I'm doing the stride size of one, meaning that every time I'm moving the filter by size one here. Um, but I can also do a uh, stride size of two, which uh, meaning that I can slide my filter twice a, twice a time, like a twice, um, twice dimensional time. So for example, again, this example, if I'm going to, uh, firstly, I'm going to be here. Uh, so there's no this part. If I'm going to slide the, uh, if I'm going to do the uh, stride size of two, we're gonna do the stride size of two, then they're gonna, uh, that's the first portion. Next time it's just gonna go start from here. Um, so I have a quick question for you guys, but if, say if we have, if, um, we have an image size of this, um, it's a four by four image. And again, we are having a three by three uh, field, we are we are having a three by three filter, and if we start from here, I'm doing a stride size of two. If I don't want to use the padding, then should I like how 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 am I gonna deal with this portion? How am I gonna deal with this portion? Anybody any idea? Um, so if you're not gonna do the padding here, you're just gonna skip this. You're just gonna, uh, so first you, uh, you apply filter on this portion, uh, on this portion, and then cause this, um, doing a stride two will move the filter to this place, and we do, want, we do not want to do padding at this place, so we don't have this, time, uh, this area here, so the filter cannot be applied to the matrix at this time, so you're just gonna skip this, so to move to the next, uh, to the next level here. So you can uh, first slide uh, uh, along the X, 
and then you're going to slide down to the Y. If you're actually uh, thinking about this, it's going to be two for loop for I in X and then for J in Y. Um, that's the way you want to implement the, the forward pass of the convolutional neural network. And you guys are actually going to do this in the homework two, part one. Um, any questions by so far? Yes? Do you have uh, different time variables for the X and Y dimension? What do you mean like different variables? For example, if you have a side of two units, you can skip by two units when you go across. Yes. So would you do the same thing with that? Uh, yes, exactly. So forget to mention. So uh, good catch. So if I'm doing a stride of two here, I'm going to first slide this, uh, uh, convolve this area. And then since there's no, um, no more area to scan along the X, I'm going to do a stride of two here, uh, which doesn't have this area also. So that's all for this image's convo convolutional uh, operation, because they don't, it does not have extra area to, uh, to convolve during, during the operation. Any other questions? Um, so good, uh, good uh, questions to ask is uh, whether we're going to do the padding or not. Normally, people are just going to do the padding of zero, adding all zeros along the, along the, uh, uh, like among the images. And then um, uh, it's going to maintain the image size for you uh, if you don't want the, sh the image to shrink too dramatically. And then uh, we also can do the stride. The stride is gonna gonna uh, like very largely reduce the, the image size, uh, since like moving the we see that uh, move, like um, have a stride of two, and compared with having a stride of uh, one, uh, make a lot of difference there. So um, this is ac actually the mass equations for the for calculating the the. Uh, the dimensions for the input, uh, input uh, matrix and the, the filter. So say if we have an input volume of n by n and it has a channel of C, then our filter size can be uh, F by F, but it has to have three chan uh, it has to have C channels. Uh, recall that in the previous the image, uh, image uh, example, we have uh, a five by five by three channels uh, image then this filter has to be also have three channels also. And then the output image is going to have the, uh, will be the uh, size m by m. Uh, so that's the equation you're going to calculate this. You're going to um, m plus 2p minus f, where p is the padding size. Um, by saying p, I mean the, the area that you're going to do the padding here. So if I have a, uh, if I have a two by two, mat uh, if I have a two by two matrix, and then I'm going to do a padding of one, then I'm going to add one to all the area here. So the, the dimension of the M, of the N, N prime, after the padding is going to be N plus 2P. So that's the, that's the general convention to represent the padding um, here. So we're going to, Add the padding and the minus the filter size divided by the, the stride size. S means the stride size. And then take the floor of that. So if that doesn't give us an integer, we're just going to take the floor of that. And then plus one will give you the, the output size of the, uh, of the images. So um, in, and now we are, we are good to, to build a convolutional neural network now. So, Normally, we're going to have um, the first dimension as batch size. And then we're going to have n, uh, which is the input image. Remember that um, I make a simple mistake here. Those two n are the same, but it doesn't have to be the same. So you can have different, uh, you can have different uh, value for this n and this n. Normally, this one is called the width. And then this one is called the height, which refers to the width and the height of the uh, the width and the height of the image. So that's going to be the width. And then that's going to be the height. So it doesn't have to be a square. It can be a rectangular um, or something. 
and uh, those two n doesn't does not have to be the same. Also, the filter size don't, um, don't have to be the same, but normally people are just gonna use square filters because it's more simple uh, to calculate. And then uh, the output size is just gonna be the m, 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 k, um, where k is the number of filters in the conv uh, convolutional neural network. Um, two things to, to remember here is that first, um, if the, this one is different with this one, then you're gonna calculate the, the size of the widths and the heights differently. Um, so if I have an image size of the BS and then uh, N1 and N2 and then channel of C, that's my uh, input. And then I have a, I have a uh, future size of uh, batch size and then future, future and then C. So, because N1 and N2 are differently, so you're gonna calculate them separately uh, by using the equation N1 equals the, uh, N1 prime equals N1 plus 2P minus future size divided by S, take floor and then add one. And N2 is just the same thing uh, without, like we change this to N2 here. So calculate the, the dimension for the width and the height differently. Just gonna gives you, uh, that's how we're gonna handle the, the different dimensions in the, uh, the, like the, the image, in, uh, the input image when input image is not a square. If it's a rectangular, it has different size of uh, height and width. That's how we're gonna calculate its size. Yes? Okay. Uh, yes, so that's what I'm gonna talk about right now. So just bear with me. So um, how are we gonna, because um, uh, previously I told, I told you guys that uh, N by N, uh, N by N by channel C input convolve with a filter with F by F by C. Uh, it will simply give us a image size of M by M. It doesn't have any further, uh, further uh, channels here. But we know that in the, in the convolutional neural network, uh, normally people are just gonna increase this, um, this K here. That's gonna be the input, uh, the output feature here. Um, I guess, so normally what people will do is that they have CNN, uh, they're gonna call PyTorch dot CNN. Um, no, it's actually convolve. And then you're gonna specify the the input uh, the input feature and the output feature. So normally the input feature for the first layer of the image uh, net is gonna be three, because normally people are just gonna have um, RGB files, and then you're just gonna specify this um, output dimension. And this output dimension is actually the K here that I have here, which refers to the uh, number of features in your uh, convolutional uh, layers. And we're gonna see how it works. So um, the first one I scan, uh, I scan my image with using a using one uh, filter here. Uh, though it's a three stack, uh, three uh, layers of input, uh, of filters stacked together, um, we're gonna we're gonna define this as one filter. So that's one filter. That's second filter. So um, these are different filters. These are um, uh, different features and then the, it gives you um, scanning, using them scan the same image will give you different output uh, metrics. And then you stack this uh, output, uh, output uh, metrics together, gives you the new output. So you don't have to do the sum operation here. It's just gonna stack together and pass into the next level. So uh, um, normally people will increase the number of the output channels a lot. So uh, a, normal, a normal thing will be like increase the three to channel of 16 and then 16 to 32, 32 to 64, and then uh, 64 to 128, 200, uh, 256. The way people do this is because they want their neural network to be able to extract as many features as they can. So the more the dimension is, the, the more information you are able to extract from the features. So that's the general logic behind the dimension change, uh, dimension change of the uh, convolutional neural network. Is there anything the network does to incentivize the different filters to start looking for 
or different features? Like, how do you stop them from, you know, if you end up kind of, their weights end up targeting the same feature? Um, I'm so sorry. Let's say you're doing like a MNIST data set, and your first layer is looking for like, you know, straight edges versus curves or something. Like, is there anything to stop half of your, half of them from all just looking for the same straight edge? Uh, yes, it depends on like the way you initialize your filter. So normally, um, people right now are just gonna have the, like a, a normal filter will be one, zero, one. Um, I think it's minus one, zero, one, minus one, and then one, zero, one. That's, that's, uh, that's a normal filter thing uh, that people gonna initialize their filter. And then these parameters, like this, these parameters here is actually gonna be the um, learnable parameters. So while you are training your CN, you can update those um, parameters um, when you're training the CN. So these are learnable parameters, and they should be able to uh, fit into those different features themselves during the training. But there's no like, there's no like extra factor you can add to the loss, similar to like when you do L2 APK, where you say like how different they are from one another is, is desirable. Are you talking about the loss? during the CN training? Just making sure that the filters don't, a few of them all look for the same pattern. There's, there's nothing you would add while training to say, try to be different, right? Um, I guess you, you just uh, misunderstanding the meaning here. The, so the, the filter is actually the W in your MLP. Right. Remember, um, and then you're gonna, the input matrix is gonna be X, so you're gonna do the X transpose times X uh, times W plus the bias, that's gonna be the output, right? And then you're gonna, let's call this Y, and then we're gonna apply this to the activation function. We're gonna, do we have a, uh, so, oops. Um, so this filter is gonna be your W. So you're gonna multiply this W with X plus B, that gives you the Y. And then you're gonna apply this I to the activation function A, which is gonna give you the Z. And then uh, you, the Z is gonna be the thing you pass to the next layer. So this Z will multiply with uh, next layer's W. Let's call this W1. So this is W2 plus B2, which gives you Y2. And then A, Y2 is gonna give you Z2. And the last layer, you're gonna pass this Z2 into your loss function, which give you, uh, which you're gonna have the loss. And then you're just gonna take the derivative of loss over all, all Ws we use here. So yes, um, the, it's the same uh, backward propagation, it just, apply on the filter. So uh, the filters should be able to detect any features by themselves by learning those parameters. Do, does that answer your question? Or? Not really, but I'll ask you afterwards. We can, we can take it offline. Okay. And um, so the, where are we right now? The convolution of neural network. Okay, so the, the filter is gonna, uh, it's just gonna simply be the W of the uh, MLP, and then the input image is the X. Um, it really doesn't matter if you are adding the B or not because um, it's just simply gonna, um, like normally people are just not gonna use the BIOS because it's gonna be canceled out in the next layer. So it, um, normally we're just gonna do W, X, and then uh, B is uh, all depends on you to use or not. So that's a convolutional neural network. Uh, the number of the feature means the, uh, the number of the output features in the next layer, uh, in the output layer. Uh, so why we want to use convolutional really do, like uh, why we want to use convolutional neural network? There are two benefits of using uh, convolutional neural network. First is um, convolution is good at extracting features. Remember we, um, in the first slides we defined the um, convolve operation as the um, mass equation that apply to two functions, 
that um, tells, like, produce a serve function that expressing like how one function's uh, shape is modified by the by the other function, right? So, what it means here in the in the real image is that uh, the com like the the output after the convolution is gonna tell us how the image is changing uh, according to the filter. So that's that's the meaning of the output, and that gives gives us useful information when we are doing image uh, related work. For example, like image classification or anything. Uh, these are the useful uh, features that we want to extract from the image. And then also convolution is a good way to reduce uh, the, the model complexity. Uh, we're going to see that in a little bit. So um, I guess that this kind of like answer your question. So how, how do you find the vertical edges in the image? You're, you know, you're just going to apply a special filter uh, that w after the convol convolutional neural network, uh, after the convolve operation, it gives you, you're gonna signif uh, significantly increase the, the, the gap that uh, the, the vertical, uh, vertical features has with the, um, with the, like the, say, the horizontal edges. I guess this is a little bit confusing because I, I, don't, I don't write this down on the, on the slides, but um, what normally you can do is that you have a future, uh, you have a you have an image, and then let's say I have two uh, filters here, one called vertical and one called horizontal. I'm just gonna have different uh, numbers in this uh, in these two filters. So for vertical, I'm gonna have one, 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 and then zero, 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 and then one, one, one. And then for the horizontal, I'm just gonna have one, 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 zero, zero, zero. So apply these two filters onto this image. We're actually um, gonna increase, like gonna, applying this vertical, uh, uh, Filter on this uh, image will, will the output image will actually only contains the uh, contains the vertical edges because all the uh, horizontal one has been canceled out by the zeros at the middle, and then the applying this horizontal filter is gonna leave you with the it's gonna leaves you with all those uh, horizontal features because all the Vertical edges has been canceled by this uh, row of zeros. Um, this doesn't have to be the like. Uh, this is not exactly the the future looks like, but that's how the logic be behind the uh, future extraction in convolutional neural network. Uh, so uh, this is a example here. So let's see the original picture has all those numbers here. We see the vertical edges. Like the the uh, output after applying the vertical filter is gonna look like that. So we see a erase all those uh, horizontal features here. Uh, take uh, for example the seven. It doesn't have this portion here, and then I guess the the most obvious one is seven. So it doesn't have this this uh, horizontal portion. But uh, for the others. Um, it still remains uh, the vertical edges. And then for the horizontal one, we, it keeps the horizontal, uh, it keeps the horizontal uh, features here, and then it just erase those um, vertical informations. And then when you convert those, it gives you the original, uh, all edges in the original picture. So um, these will be the output from each layer of your convolution, uh, convolutional, uh, convolutional uh, neural network, and this will be the the features that uh, that you are interested in to do whatever the image job you want to do. Uh, this is just simply another example. So originally we have this image, and then uh, the horizontal applied it looks like that. The vertical is just gonna um, gonna uh, Gonna contain all those vertical information, 
and then we're just gonna combine them together so we have this um, new image. I know this is um, not cl as clear as this one, but um, the, the thing that were really interesting is these pictures because they be able to distinguish the vertical and the, and the horizontal edges. And it's, um, one thing to note is that it's not just only the vertical and the horizontal edges. There can be any other forms of edges, say like the diagonalized uh, edges. It can be like curly edges or like square edges. So you can design, you don't have to design, but you can, you can say you can initialize um, 10 filters which uh, each of them gonna uh, gonna looking for different uh, age features there, and then during the training of the new, uh, convolutional neural network, it's just gonna automatically learn how to extract those features from the from the original input um, by change the parameters in the filters. So all those parameters in those filter uh, again all those parameters in those filters are learnable uh, parameters. So that's going to be the W you want to update in your backward propagation. So any question right now? Um, so this is just a repeat of the previous, uh, previous what we talked about. Like uh, it's the convolutional neural network is good at feature extraction. You can, uh, you're gonna be able to uh, extract any features like the vertical and the horizontal features from the image, and then that's gonna be the information you want to use to do the image classification or uh, identification or anything. Another uh, good feature about convolutional neural network is that it actually reduces the the complexity compared with the MLP. So uh, neural network has uh, convolutional neural network has less parameters to learn, and the training speed will be will be quicker uh, because uh, because the decrease of the number of parameters there. So I'm going to take this example from the homework uh, homework one part two. So remember in homework one part two we have a uh, so we have the um, the waves here. If you haven't done homework uh, one part two. Um, we have an input size of 40, and then that's just going to be the uh, frame here. So I'm talking about uh, using a contact size 10, which means I'm going to apply, I'm going to have more, 10 more here, and then 10 more frame here. Each frame is just a 40, uh, it's just a 40 vector. It's just a 40 vector, so um, that's going to be the input size for my example. And and then the so the 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 input size is going to be 21, 40. That's uh, 1 plus 10 plus 10, and then 40. The output dimension is going to be 138, which is exactly you did in the homework two part uh, homework one part two. So we're going to calculate the number of parameters uh, to be learned for three layers of MLP, with uh, each layer has a hidden size of 128. Uh, it's going to be a simple calculation. It's going to be 24 uh, times 40 times 108. And then for the next three layer, it's going to be fully connected. So we have 128 times 128, another fully connected layer, and then this another uh, fully connected layer with different dimension at the end. And that's going to roughly give us uh, on 160k uh, parameters in total. That's a lot of parameters to learn for a, a three layer of an MLP. Given that um, it's only a three-layer MLP here. However, if we are using the CNN here, the same thing. If um, it's not actually, it's not the same thing. I'm using ten layer of CNN, and I'm using three uh, filters, each of size three by three, stretch one, and I'm not doing pa any padding here. Uh, and then I'm gonna do the fully connected layer in the end. So. You can see that those CNN number, uh, CNN layers doesn't gives you many uh, parameters here, right? So that's going to be uh, 81 times 9, which which is 720, uh, 729, and this is just going to be 27. That's all the parameters CNN used to do 10 layers of CNN, and all those 100k is given by the last fully connected layer. So compared with uh, with the uh, uh, fully connected layer, uh, CN definitely has less time complexity because uh, it reduced uh, it dramatically reduced the number of the 
uh, parameters in, in its net. Any questions? Uh, it's just the fully connect layer at the end. Like remember, um, remember, the, like the, did you understand this equation here? This, uh, how we calculate this? So it's, it's exactly the same thing, because after, um, after the CNN, you're actually gonna flatten your output into, two uh, into three dimensions, and then uh, you're gonna apply a fully connect layer um, so that it can be classified into whatever the output class you want, right? So it's, it's simply just a fully connected layer. And then the, the output dimension is 19 times 38, and then the 138 is the output class you want. So times them together gives you the, the final uh, future size, uh, the, 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 the number of parameters in this fully connected layer. Again, this, this is a very large number, and the CNN are very, very small numbers here, so that really gives us a, like a idea of how simple the, the CNN parameters are, like how, how, how less parameters CNN has compared with MLP. So that's a, that's a major reason people want to use CNN, because people want to reduce the, the complexity of their network. Uh, next, I'm gonna cover the pooling. So um, pooling is a very um, important uh, operation in the CNN because you actually want to um, you want to magnify the you want to magnify the the features that you extract from the from the uh, using the CNN. So um, there are two types of pooling. Uh, one is average pooling. One is max pooling. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about the max pooling here. So uh, there's really no match here. The pooling is just apply a filter again. But this time, um, you are not getting the dot product. You are just calculating the max number here. So for example, this one, um, again, I'm gonna apply, remember I'm gonna apply a filter. Uh, this is a size of four by four image. I'm gonna apply a filter size of two by two. So uh, apply this filter to here. The, this filter doesn't contain any parameters. It's just empty filter and then uh, the original number, we're just gonna pick the, the maximum number here, which is six. So I'm gonna put six in this filter, uh, in this place. And then we're gonna slide uh, a little bit with a stride of two, um, so that uh, we, we are here, and then we get the max number is eight. Uh, so eight come to here. And then we uh, move to the next level. Uh, three again is the max number, so we have three here. And then this one is four. Remember that normally we do not do repeat uh, during the during the pulling. So if I'm doing a two, if I'm doing a two by two uh, filter size for the pulling, then normally my my stride size will be two. If I'm doing a three by three filter, uh, normally my my stride size will be three, because I don't I don't want to uh, calculate the max again and again and again for each filter. Because it's very likely that um, the the reason why we're doing this is that it's very likely that um, this number, let's say this is zero, one, two, and four. So this number is the largest number in the first filter, uh, in the first area, and then still it's the sec uh, it's the biggest number in the second area. So we don't want to double count this. This limits the ability to see and learn stuff. Uh, so we don't want to do that. So normally we're just going to do a uh, stride size equal to the filter size, so that um, the, the pooling gives us better results. Um, this is max pooling. We can also do average pooling. The only difference is that instead of uh, finding the max, uh, max value here, we're just gonna take the um, average of those four numbers. So if we are applying a max uh, uh, average pooling here, then the output we're gonna have is, we're just gonna take the average of those four numbers. And then what, uh, whatever the number is there is our uh, output. This is seven divided by four. Uh, so it's gonna be seven divided by four. So we're just gonna put seven divided by four on our first uh, position in the output. So that's the uh, average pooling. So average pooling and max pooling are the two types of pooling. 
uh, that we used in the uh, CN and they are used for, for future extraction. They are also used for if you want to shrink your image size. So uh, for homework two, part two, you're gonna work with the uh, image, uh, you're gonna do the face classification, and then the, the there's a millions of images. The, the data size is very large. So, uh, and the, it gonna takes you hours, hours to train one epoch. So how, how are you gonna reduce the, the, the time of training? The, the max pulling and doing the stride in the CNN is a good idea to do. That you actually shrink the image size through each layer. So you actually get a smaller image size and that can uh, decrease the time that you train your network. Um, this is a very useful trick you want to apply in your homework two part two. So uh, I already, I already I already talked about the convolutional backward. It's the same thing here. Uh, yes? Normally, people will do this at the end of their convolutional layer. Uh, not after each, but at the end of the all the uh, convolutional. So max pooling is actually because um, um, go back to here. We see that the the parameters that really increase the number of parameters is just the last layer, right? And that depends on how many uh, the the parameters here. So max pooling gonna uh, decrease this amount of number, so you're gonna decrease the the number of the uh, fully connected layers, the parameters in the fully connected layers. And that cannot decrease the numbers a lot. And so that's why people usually use it at the end of the convolutional neural network. Yes. And um, not just the max pooling, the average pooling, and the, the stride in normal CN, they all gonna uh, decrease the, the size of the image. So these are all useful tricks to, if you want to reduce the time to train your uh, network. And then the, the convolutional backward. So uh, what we have here is the, the filter is just going to be your W, and then the activation function and the Z um, apply to the uh, activation function. You get the Y, you, you have the loss. So for each filter in your convolutional neural network, you're just going to calculate this, and you're going to sum them up to the backward propagation. Um, that's exactly the thing you guys are going to do in your homework uh, two, part one. So just a little bit. Uh, like highlights for homework two part uh, for homework two, for the first part you're gonna do the CN back uh, forward and backward propagation. Uh, you're not gonna implement the the max pulling or the uh, the the average pulling because it's too much troublesome. You're just not you're just gonna do the forward and backward uh, for CN, and then uh, for the second part you're gonna do a uh, face uh, classification on data sets given by us. And uh, you're also gonna do the face verification, like give two images, you're gonna tell if these two pictures belong to the same person or not. And that's the two tasks you get into um, homework two, part two. It's gonna be a lot of data and the training uh, time is very long, so be prepared, uh, be prepared for that. And next, Samira is gonna talk about the, the uh, code of the CN. I have a question. Yes? Um, actually, there's no parameters there, right? Because you're just taking the max or take the a uh, average, so there's no parameters there. So. So will it affect the derivative of previous parameters, like the filter, because it will also change the output of the field, the convolution? Uh, well, you're just gonna the like the the max filter. Uh, the the max the max uh, pooling here. Remember, you just take the max value of that. So that the derivative of that uh, uh, that element is going to be one, right? Because that's the only thing determining the next value the value for for this position, and the other is just going to be zero. That, does that make sense? Yeah. And then Samara is going to talk about the convolutional network. Don't take this.
All right. Yeah, so um, you can see clearly, right? I'll just zoom in into the notebook so that you can read also. Uh, the link to the notebook is posted on Piazza if you want to uh, run each cell or whatever along with the recitation. So you can access the notebook on the GitHub link posted on Piazza. So uh, now we're going to just dig into some code part of uh, convolution neural networks uh, and some functions that you often use along with CNNs uh, when you're coding general uh, networks in any deep learning framework. Uh, so if, uh, these are the uh, basic links that you should definitely go through uh, uh, just for basic understanding. Uh, I'm just going to uh, show you a brief. Uh, so uh, William talked about uh, how padding and striding affects the filters and how it manipulates the size of the network, right? So this is a uh, just an animation which can ex which gives you the uh, basic insight into uh, how this looks like. The blue map is your input image, and uh, your kernel uh, or your filter is of size three by three, and the green thing is the output that comes out of uh, uh, the convolution operation. So when there are no padding and no strides, uh, the kernel is just uh, uh, stepping one by one in x direction and then in the y direction. And so for a four by four image, the output comes out to be two by two for a three by three kernel. So uh, the, first row, the first row uh, gives you examples where there are different sizes of padding. So the padding looks like these dotted uh, lines which you see. Uh, so in the first case, there are two padding, uh, two paddings uh, associated in both directions, uh, width and height. So uh, that's how the kernel uh, uh, basically scans through the input image, and you can see that uh, it goes out of the image, like part of the kernel goes out of the image in order when the padding is added. Uh, and so on. Uh, so there are various types of padding, like uh, arbitrary uh, padding or half padding. Half padding is basically when you want to uh, map the center of the kernel uh, to the last uh, or the most uh, extreme cornermost cell of your input image. So uh, that would half padding would make sure that you have enough padding to be able to do that. So if it's a three by three kernel, that would require one by one padding. And similarly for full padding. So the second row uh, shows you values with different strides. And you can see that the kernel is stepping through multiple x, uh, multiple cells in x and along with y direction as well. So uh, these are different uh, examples that you can just look at uh, to understand the concept of how padding and stride works. Because that helps you a lot in understanding why the sizes of the layers are changing. The, uh, on the input image that you're working on. So going back to the notebook, these are some basic uh, libraries that you will need to import whenever you're uh, writing a deep learning uh, framework in using PyTorch. Uh, so uh, I'm, go I'm gonna tell you like whenever which one is useful as we go through the notebook. So uh, first part is what kind of uh, data format your convolutional uh, net networks convolution layers in PyTorch expect you to be giving. So uh, in general, we have seen that images are of the dimension, uh, number of uh, height, what is the length, height of the width of the image, the width and the channels. So generally channels come in uh, the last dimension, but the PyTorch uh, functions and layers expect them to be uh, the first dimension. So your input is expect to be expected to be number of samples, which is the batch size, uh, cross channels, cross height and width. This is also called the NCHW or the channels first notation. And uh, it depends from also framework to framework. PyTorch uses this. Uh, you might have to check uh, whichever framework you're using, TensorFlow or whatever, which, what uh, uh, principles they follow. So similarly for 1D data, which is like signals or prizes, uh, it would be samples, cross channels, cross time. Uh, so uh, this is how you initialize, let's say uh, we want to initialize a basic uh, image uh, of uh, random pixel values. 
So the uh, Toy Story Random just creates a random uh, number uh, matrix with the dimensions 1 by 3 by 32 by 32. So 1 is your the sample size, uh, 3 is number of channels, 32 is uh, height and width. And you convert that to uh, autograd variable. Uh, why you can need to convert that to variable? So PyTorch has this complicated uh, rules why you need to convert tensors to variables uh, to be use them to be able to use them for layers. So as we print the input size of the of the tensor that is created out of this, uh, this comes out to be what we expected. And similarly for the signal uh, data, which will just have your channels. For example, in your homework one, you had 40 channels uh, for the input. And so this comes I1 by 40 by 100. So uh, PyTorch has like uh, several types of convolution layers. Uh, most common that you would be using would be just con 1D, 2D layers. Uh, we will be talking about image data in this recitation. So that's why we'll be using mostly 2D, con 2D layers. So, uh, and uh, several, uh, these max pool and average pool we'll be talking about later. So uh, that, that is how you initialize a basic layer of PyTorch. NN is the module of Torch that uh, contains all these uh, layers and all many other functions that you'll be using later on. Uh, just uh, make sure you check out the uh, documentation of PyTorch NN module because it's very helpful and uh, very intuitive if you want to just understand how to use a layer or how to use any function. They give good examples for that. So uh, here you initialize what will be the input channels, uh, which is uh, th how the input image, uh, how many channels it has, and the output channels that you want out of the convolution, and the kernel size, the stride, and the padding. So uh, these stride and padding uh, values uh, determine the uh, dimensions of your final output. And uh, make sure uh, you play around with them or uh, just you understand what the basic uh, uh, idea behind using stride and padding is. So uh, if you've like, initialized these layers uh, using just torch.nn.conf2d and similar for average pool 2d, then you go on and uh, use them for your forward pass. Uh, that would be simply calling the uh, layer uh, initialize variable and just passing the input image to that. So that is simply your forward pass. And uh, after you another way to do that is uh, it, that would be like more in a more com compact manner. So let's say if you have like 10, 20 layers in your model and uh, you don't want to be writing each and every layer and calling uh, the, passing the input and output to each layer because there are, there's a potential of making many mistakes in that. So sequential is a type of container that Torch provides uh, which uh, Com which contains uh, and packs all the layers that you provided and uh, executes them in a sequential manner. So we've provided here the average pooling in the convolutional uh, layers. And uh, to, to do the forward pass on this model, you would just pass the input image and it would go through both the pooling and the convolutional layer. So as you can see, the dimensions uh, of the input change from, so, uh, from input three to 20 channels and 32 by 32 because of the particular setting of stride and padding. Uh, so PyTorch uh, has another uh, module that uh, is called functional. Uh, that is basically used when you want to in in initialize your parameters by yourself. So by parameters like, I mean, the kernels, the f values of the filter values and all. And uh, <clears throat> why would you need to do that in general is for example, when you are learning a kernel itself from another neural network, and uh, you want to use that kernel for this specific uh, conv layer, then in that case, you might be using that. But in this particular course, you will not uh, have the need to use any of these functional, functional layers in, in particular. Uh, so moving on to padding, so uh, as William explained how different padding sizes and uh, stride sizes uh, determine the output and dimension of your uh, uh, output. So uh, as you can see, just try to understand like how the increasing the padding value uh, one by one 
is changing the dimensions of the output height and width. So let's say our input was uh, 32 by 32 and then uh, with zero padding it comes out to be this. Then as and when we keep increasing padding, it just increased by two in each dimension. And uh, another way to introduce like a comp, so these padding values are kind of like square values, like you introduce one padding in each direction, uh, both height and width. But you can also use complicated like uh, values for different padding values in every dimension, uh, for which you will need to pass a tuple of uh, the padding. Uh, another way to uh, any, another way to pad your uh, image is to introduce a separate layer of PyTorch, which uh, there are several uh, types of padding layers. And uh, so for example here, uh, you see that the replication pad uh, uh, is another layer that first pads the input and then passes that to the convolution layer. So uh, Replication pad and uh, reflection pad, there are several uh, layers that will make sure how, uh, how the, what the padded value consists of. So in general, if you're just using padding over here uh, with default parameters, it's just padding the image with zero values. Uh, but over here, uh, they will pad with different, uh, different uh, on a, based on your use case, you will be using these different layers. Uh, so coming to normalization and dropout, uh, why, so normalization, uh, batch norm and dropout are one of the two, uh, are the two concepts that uh, significantly affect the performance and uh, accuracy of your model. So uh, playing around with these, definitely you see uh, uh, like clear changes that your output might give. Uh, so uh, in general, uh, what dropout does is, uh, we're, so I, we would advise uh, not to use the standard versions of batch norm and dropout uh, of PyTorch. So standard versions are just, uh, go like just batch norm and just dropout. Um, so uh, why uh, I would say not to use the standard version of dropout would be uh, what they do is, uh, for example, is dropout uh, simply, they drop out the values in a one dimensional. So for example, you've seen that images in general have so many pixel values that are kind of redundant. So uh, pixel values uh, just right next to each other would have a similar value. And uh, if you get rid of uh, any of those, uh, it would not really cause any loss in data or uh, it would not uh, eventually help you regularize the model as such. So just using dropout would uh, drop out these uh, random values in the in input and uh, on, on one uh, particular channel, and it will do that for all channels. So that is not really causing any special loss in data. And uh, so if you use uh, in comparison, like in contrast, dropout 2D, what it does is, uh, it drops out, it just selects with the probability of like, for example, 0.5. Uh, it will select uh, whichever channel it wants to drop out and uh, it will wipe out the entire channel of the input. So uh, this, of course, you don't want to do on your input image because that will just black out the image. But for example, uh, after a convolution layer, you set the output channels to be like 20 and you want uh, randomly like half of them to be dropped out then uh, you will just use dropout 2D and like half of the channels would be dropped out. So uh, that is also based on the probability that you provide here, which is the drop, ob drop probability. And uh, uh, how that helps is uh, it just uh, helps the feature maps to not become independent, interdependent of each other. And uh, if each uh, feature map is maintained, if each feature map corresponding to each channel is maintained, then uh, they might just try uh, eventually start learning what, uh, and depending on each other. So uh, that's how Dropout helps in regularizing. So yes, I would suggest uh, using the 2D versions of it mostly. And batch norm also, uh, you can use the 1D version, but uh, 2D will always give you better performance. Uh, so, in, so, da, so there are several operations uh, which help you downsample the input. Uh, by downsampling, we mean that reducing the dimension size of the input. So for example, you know that there are 
there is a lot of redundant data in the input. The input is just mostly very similar objects. Uh, in the like, for example, it just consists of grass in the whole background and just one uh, small object in it. So uh, you would want to downsample the data and. Uh, to do that, PyTorch provides the max pooling, which is the most famous and it's just very simple to use and is kind of neuro neurologically inspired. So what it does is uh, it will, uh, a particular pooling uh, filter will give you like, for example, five. If five is the uh, maximum value present in that particular window at which kernel is looking at. So, uh, and it doesn't matter to the filter or to the layers ahead where this five came from, where exactly in the window it was, as long as it was there. So, uh, pack spooling in a way uh, helps you to introduce uh, like space invariance and translation and invariance, and uh, that helps you like uh, in uh, basically uh, optimizing or basically tuning your networks. So uh, max pooling over here, you can see that it reduces the size as well. So if I'm providing the kernel size to be two, uh, the input image uh, size reduces just by a factor of two. Similarly for average pooling. Uh, another way to downsample your data is using uh, a combination of stride and priding, and as we talked about previously. Yeah. So uh, for upsampling, uh, for example, you have less amount of data and uh, you want to just augment your data set or whatever reasons. Uh, upsampling is used to, uh, which has like uh, similar effects like downsampling, just increases, increases, them, increases the dimensions by a scale factor. So uh, Torch has a NN dot upsample layer which, in which you pro provide just the scale factor and uh, a mode in which it determines uh, what values to put in that pix in the new pixels that are being introduced. So uh, that might be dependent on what the nearest values are. So as you can see, the input was 16 by 16, and it just upsampled to 32 by 32. Uh, so uh, another way of upsampling is uh, basically using a combination of convolution and shuffling. Uh, so so, uh, convolution, for example, uh, if you have a lot of channels in the input uh, coming out from any convolutional layer or so, and uh, you want to you want to expand your height and width accordingly and reduce the channels, uh, then this uh, shuffling would help you in that case. So, for example, here the input channels were uh, output channels coming out of the convolution was three into two by two. So here I'm going to be trying to uh, increase the uh, scale by a factor of two. So this will increase the height and width in by two and then at the same time reduce the number of channels by four. So it's just a, a normal shuffling operation. Uh, another way to do it that is uh, using transpose, convolution transpose, uh, which does just so whatever uh, dimension convolution 2D reduces uh, your input from, convolution transpose 2D brings it back to that particular dimension. So if you see here in the output, uh, the input was 3 by 32 by 32. Applying convolution on that uh, reduced uh, downsampled our output to 20 by 17 by 17. Uh, uh, and then uh, when we apply convolution transpose, it just uh, gave, returned it back to the same dimension. So coming back to how to read image data, and uh, this will uh, make use of the library Torch Vision, which is present in PyTorch, which is majorly uh, for image data and ha provides various functions that you can use for that. So there are several ways of uh, reading input, input uh, images. And uh, we're going to be just using a couple of those, uh, like uh, SK image and pillow. And uh, so uh, let's say we just read a particular image with this particular syntax present in the given path. And uh, the, the syntax for plotting that image is doing uh, dot im dot show, dot im show, and then passing the image that you want to uh, plot. And similarly, PL, uh, 
PL2 dot, PLT dot show to basically give the output of the image. So uh, if you can see the dimensions of this image is 273 by 185 by 3. And please note that this is uh, height, width and channels. So this uh, library will give you the image which is read in this order. But uh, your PyTorch accepts uh, it in the order of channels first as we talked about before. So make sure you uh, change the shape of the array and uh, make sure you place the channels first after an image has been read. Similarly, uh, using pillow for reading an image, uh, after doing image.open, you can convert the image to an NP array. And uh, sim uh, sim similar to last one, use matplotlib's plot library to uh, plot the image. Uh, so you, uh, you would have heard of a lot of data pre-processing techniques that are used to um, that are used before you even get to you know writing your model or uh, uh, tuning your model. So data pre-processing uh, plays a huge role in that, and uh, PyTorch provides some brand, uh, some layers that uh, some functions that help you uh, do these pre-processing techniques. So transforms is a library in which you can just compose uh, a set of uh, transformations and apply that to your uh, data directly. So like for example, this is doing random re resize crop. It just uh, randomly uh, crops the image, part of the image, and then resizes it to 100. And then random horizontal flip, and then finally converting it to tensor since the input was uh, in NPRA. So, uh, how that how you'll use that is when you're using the data set class of PyTorch. Uh, one way to access your data set is uh, using the class image folder. So image folder expects the data set to be present in a way that you have a root directory, and that root directory contains many subdirectories. Each subdirectory corresponds to a particular class of images. So class as in each subdirectory could be dog, cat or whatever and which whatever the output classes are expected to be and uh, image folder uh, takes these some directories and uh, determines uh, corresponding labels of each ev each and every image and uh, we'll see how you use that uh, in a bit so you pass this uh, data set uh, in that is initialized to the data loader as is and uh, also, uh, the transforms, uh, the transformations that you initialize will be passed to the data set because the data set class will make sure that it does uh, each and every transformation on each and every image. Uh, then this data set is passed to the data loader and you specify the batch size that you want and uh, if you need to shuffle the images and uh, number of workers is basically to distribute your computations. So uh, when this data loader is initialized, you can uh, one by one uh, iterate over the data loader and it will give you uh, a tuple of the image and its corresponding label. So the image, uh, it will give you in a, a format that you need to convert to the NumPy. So it will basically give it in a tensor format because we apply the particular transformation here. But for example, we want to plot it later, then we first convert it to NumPy, NumPy and then just plot it. So if you can see that this is just a part of the original image that we were looking at, and it is uh, zoomed in to come to the dimensions of 100 by 100. And all this is uh, random resize crop and all this is happening randomly. So every time I uh, run this particular cell, it'll give me a different output and different parts of the image will be uh, cropped and resized. Then uh, coming to how to write your basic CNN module, uh, this part of the uh, code is uh, not uh, runnable. This is just for your reference, how to organize your layers and how to call forward and backward on that, which might be useful for you in the coming homework. So uh, basically you declare a class uh, of your model and in, a, in the init function, you initialize all the layers that you want to use as uh, nn.conf2d and then assign them to variables. All this can also instead be done in the nn.sequential module that I uh, talked about before, which is a better way of doing it since you don't have to worry about calling forward and backward on each of these uh, later. 
So, as you initialize the layers and the activations, uh, then the forward pass uh, for a given input x is done simply on, uh, so here you can see I created a list of uh, all the layers. So, I'm just calling each layer from that and then just passing the input to the layer directly. That is all that you need to do a forward on that layer. So, and in backwards, similarly, you go through the layers uh, in the reverse direction and uh, you just call doc backward on that uh, particular layer. Uh, now, so uh, you would have seen that actually in the coming modules, in the coming homeworks, uh, you would need to train your convolution neural networks or uh, ne neural networks in general for a very uh, long period of time. So let's say if you have to train it just for like 10 epochs and each epoch takes 30 minutes, then uh, you need to make sure that you save the uh, model every at every uh, epoch so that you can load it afterwards and you can run your tests or whatever. So make sure you save your weights. And to do that, a short way of doing that is just model.stateDict in which you uh, just take the model's parameters and pass it to torch.save. And when you've saved that and you later on want to load the parameters, you will do just the model.loadStateDict and uh, pass the par path of the model to torch.load. So this is how you do it. Uh, since we just have a couple of minutes left, I will jump to the more important part. Uh, you can look at this portion of pre-trained models later on. This is just uh, telling you how to use models that are uh, previously present in PyTorch, which are famous and uh, used by uh, many uh, architectures as a base network. Uh, so coming to debugging your CNNs modules, uh, you want to basically find out if your CNN is uh, doing uh, way out of your expectations, then uh, what are the prospective things that you could be looking at? So let's say in our VGG module over here, I want to cut down the output of the, uh, I want to just extract the output at this particular point, the 30th layer. Uh, and then I wa I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is just, okay, uh, just, yeah, forget the last part. Uh, if I'm using VGG's uh, feature layers, and uh, let's say I'm plotting the outputs of the feature maps after the first convolution layer, and after all five, first five convolution layers. So the output would look something like this. This is the output after first layer, and this one is after the second layer, uh, first five layers. So what you want to make sure is that uh, the, these are feature maps that are coming out of the convolution layer. So uh, for debugging in general, you, could, you can look at that most of these feature maps should be active uh, or uh, they should not be like blacked out complete, completely. Uh, that will ensure that uh, a lot of feature maps are involved in computing a particular class. And uh, also another thing to look at is that these features, feature maps do not look very similar. They, uh, as you can see that several of them are learning different kind of features, like some of them are texture related, some of them are uh, contrast related, some of them are looking at different uh, gradients. So uh, you can see that these are different feature maps, which looks good. And in general, other techniques to debug your CNNs would be to uh, keep track of your training and validation loss curves, uh, which should uh, not be uh, looking to fancy messed up or something like your uh, one way to determine if your model is overfitting is your training loss keeps decreasing with time if you've trained for a long time but your validation loss starts increasing suddenly uh, so these are the very common metrics of debugging and uh, monitoring the loss curves is uh, an important way to do it so yeah uh, go through the notebook and post any doubts that you have on piazza uh, we're mostly done, but if you have any questions, I would uh, feel free, free, free to ask, please. Nothing? Okay, awesome. So let us know if you have anything on Piazza. Thank you, everyone.